Okay, so uh, after what I think has been a really uh, interesting and exciting day, uh, finding out all about what's going to happen with the mission, um, it looks like we're going to have plenty of time to uh, read some books uh, waiting for uh, Osiris Rex to get to uh, Benno and then back. Um, so uh, they invited uh, uh, me, Scott Zalisker, and my colleague Chris Kokinos, uh, who'll speak after me from the English department. Um, I'm an assistant professor of English here at the U of A, uh, and I teach and write about uh, science and technology uh, and American culture. Um, I think that the OSIRIS-REx mission is really rightly firing up everyone's imagination. Uh, we're unlocking an aspect of the solar system um, that's going to, in the future, uh, give us our first resources um, from outer space and uh, a new kind of place uh, to explore. So what do we think of when we think uh, of asteroids? Today, um, I'll spend a few minutes talking about the history of what we've thought of when we think uh, of asteroids. Um, in fact, they've fired up our imaginations for a very long time and in several very different ways. Um, so I'll talk about a few of them um, from history and from the history of science fiction. And I'll also want to ask, uh, as we move into Q&A at the end, uh, what kinds of things uh, you all think of with asteroids and what kinds of uses uh, you think we might have for them. So we've seen uh, meteors uh, shooting stars uh, throughout uh, human history. Uh, we've ascribed all kinds of uh, ritual and astrological uh, meanings to them. Um, asteroids out in space in uh, the asteroid belt have a much shorter history. Um, Ceres, uh, which has since been uh, reclassified as a dwarf planet, I'm afraid, uh, was uh, discovered uh, by the Italian astronomer Giuseppe uh, Piazza in 1801. So it's just a little bit more than 200 years that we've known what the asteroid uh, belt is. And of course, Ceres uh, is the largest of them now that it's no longer one of them. Um, and uh, so it was the easiest to see, right? It was uh, something that someone with a telescope from uh, 1801 could look up and happen to find in between uh, Mars and Jupiter. Um, since then, we've found uh, thousands more, um, and many of them much smaller. I was going to do a size comparison on the screen uh, and realized that uh, Bennu uh, would have to be a single pixel. Uh, so it wouldn't really help us all that much uh, to have the size comparison. Uh, in two pictures. Um, so th this has been a, uh, uh, you know, blown up uh, a couple thousand times. Uh, Ceres is about the size of Texas. Uh, Bennu is a little bit taller than the Empire State Building. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about three different ways that we've told stories about asteroids. Um, we've known about them for a long time, and there have been uh, a couple of main threads in the history of science fiction, the kind of uh, uh, stories that try to extrapolate what might happen in the future with the things that we might know about, that we know about now. Um, one of the biggest genres, especially in movies, has to do with the asteroid hitting us. Um, you might remember uh, Armageddon. Uh, you may have heard of asteroid first impact. I think there may be reasons that you haven't heard of without warning, cosmic shock, and so forth. There, there are tons of these movies um, about what's going to happen when an asteroid hits us. Um, you know, er everyone has to come together. Usually uh, they end with us, you know, finding the asteroid and nuking it from orbit, right? That's, uh, that's the way to really get rid of it. Um, and, you know, as as kind of formulaic as these movies are, they're not, um, you know, they're not without reason. The um, uh, Chelyabinsk uh, meteor that hit in uh, uh, Siberia uh, in 2013 uh, caused an enormous amount of damage. It had 
uh, more uh, explosive energy in it than uh, any of the nuclear weapons that we've tested uh, on Earth. Um, it wounded, I think, about a thousand people, blew in windows and so forth. Um, luckily, we don't have too much to worry about. As the previous uh, presentation was saying, we track asteroids very uh, carefully. Um, uh, uh, I know about asteroid tracking that goes on at the Goldstone Observatory, uh, which is out in the uh, Mojave Desert in California. Um, there's also a uh, private foundation uh, called the B612 uh, Foundation that uh, is investigating new ways to, uh, for instance, uh, see whether we can find asteroids that might be coming to us straight uh, from the trajectory of the sun, right? So um, the, the Chelyabinsk meteor, we actually uh, didn't see it coming because it was coming, you know, we, we had like the glare of the sun in our eyes uh, and weren't able to see uh, that asteroid. I like the B612 uh, uh, foundation uh, because of where they take their name from. Does anybody know? <laughs> no, from a children's book from 1943, uh, the, <laughs> the Little Prince. Uh, it sounds like a few people know it. Um, they actually just made uh, a new uh, um, uh, animated film out of it uh, in France that I hear is now streaming uh, on Netflix. Um, but it's a, it's a well-beloved story about uh, a prince uh, who comes to Earth, but his home was this tiny asteroid. Um, we don't know exactly how he breathed on this asteroid, um, but you know he he seems uh, he seems to be doing okay at least in that picture. Um, so, in the history of science fiction, asteroids have tended to take such second fiddle to planets um, in terms of how exciting they are, because you know when. Uh, in Star Trek, they go to find something new. Uh, really, in most any book where they go to find someone or something new, uh, they go to a planet. Um, but there are ways in which asteroids' smallness actually uh, makes them uh, kind of good candidates for uh, special kinds of stories. So uh, a lot of the time, asteroids are simply obstacles, right? They're part of the variety of space. Um, so in The Empire Strikes Back, there's a great uh, chase sequence where the Millennium Falcon uh, hides in the asteroid field. Um, there are also uh, several opportunities for Jean-Luc Picard to get behind uh, the helm of the Enterprise in the new next generation um, to navigate treacherous uh, asteroid fields. So they're kind of an obstacle, right? Um, and uh, this has actually made it uh, a kind of star uh, in a famous video game. Um, any, anybody ever play Asteroids? Yeah, uh, it came out in 1979. There were, uh, when I was a kid in the early 90s, it looked more like this, um, but it was, the, it was exactly the same game, uh, uh, taking a little tiny ship uh, around and trying to dodge uh, all of the asteroids. Um, asteroid, my favorite asteroid video game, though, uh, is Super Mario Galaxy uh, because it uses the, the kind of low gravity effects to, to really great effect. Like, it's really fun to jump off an asteroid and then to land on the next one over uh, and then to do it over and over again and collect all the little coins. Um, so asteroids are part of stories as just this particular kind of weird object in space. Um, they're also part of a number of short stories and novels uh, by people like um, Robert Heinlein, or Robert Heinlein, um, uh, Paul Anderson, um, and others, um, where asteroids are uh, a kind of source of uh, resources. Um, you, you mine asteroids, and actually there's uh, a great, uh, uh, a sort of a sort of offbeat British uh, comedy show uh, where everyone, where uh, uh, oh, sorry, it's called the Red Dwarf, um, where all of the officers are in a future that's distant enough that being an asteroid miner 
is kind of a job like any other one. Um, it's kind of a day in, day out, uh, boring job uh, with weird coworkers uh, and so forth. Um, but, um, and you know, one of the things um, that uh, we've thought about mining uh, from particular asteroids uh, has been water. Um, we've uh, realized that both it's a good uh, resource for us uh, as people who drink water, um, but also a good way to make uh, hydrogen and oxygen uh, to make rocket fuel. And a few um, uh, science fiction authors have taken, th have taken that a couple steps further. Um, if you get to an asteroid, uh, th this is uh, just a concept uh, art piece by uh, an artist named Brian Versteeg, who does a lot of uh, space concept artwork. Um, but if you get to an asteroid that has rocket fuel, then maybe what you do is you attach to it, or you dig into it, um, and uh, it becomes not just a piece of space, uh, but itself a spaceship. Um, and a number of uh, science fiction authors, um, uh, many of the best kind of contemporary hard science fiction authors, the one who are really uh, keeping up with what's going on in the science, um, have thought uh, about turning asteroids into habitats. So that's the, the kind of last uh, thing. Uh, also, uh, this also happens in the X-Men, uh, where Magneto, uh, a lot of the asteroids have iron. I think there's uh, an, an iron uh, meteorite outside. Um, so iron is perfect for Magneto, uh, the bad guy from the um, X-Men. But I'll mention a couple of uh, recent novels that we can uh, all take a look at uh, in the next couple of years while we wait for uh, the next piece of news from Osiris uh, Rex. Um, one of them is by uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, um, an author who comes to Tucson pretty often, actually, and, and is a really nice guy, and also a very uh, uh, well-educated and um, uh, kind of up-to-speed uh, scientific uh, science fiction author. And his book, 2312, um, imagines you know, a future where we've colonized Mars already and we're starting to colonize other planets. And uh, asteroids become not just a source uh, of fuel, but um, spaceships uh, uh, after a fashion. And they also become a, a place to preserve old Earth biomes. So uh, what, th what they've done um, in this kind of fan art rendering um, is shown how you would take um, an asteroid and hollow it out, make it spin around so that you have gravity, um, and then preserve something like the African savanna or uh, the rainforest uh, inside of it. Actually, in the movie uh, Interstellar uh, recently, um, Matthew McConaughey comes home to what he thinks is home, but it's actually a museum inside of an asteroid um, that uh, you, know, you see, you, you look at this farm and it looks kind of funny for a second, and then you realize um, that he's in this uh, sort of tube. Uh, I'll also mention and recommend uh, a book that's about to be made into a movie um, by uh, Ron Howard. Um, so I, I have high hopes for it. It's called Seven Eves uh, by uh, Neil Stevenson. Um, and it has a lot of plot twists that I don't want to give away. Um, but what happens at the beginning of the novel is that we find out that Earth is no longer inhabitable. And so we have to, with the science that we have now, um, figure out how to uh, survive, or have a few people at least survive in space uh, within five years' time. So um, you know, all kinds of questions go into this about um, you know, both the future of humanity and the technology that might make it possible. Um, and another, another uh, great fan uh, of this novel has done a rendering of what the International Space Station uh, will look like uh, halfway through Neil Stevenson's novel, uh, where we've brought uh, an asteroid uh, uh, to uh, kind of dock onto it um, in uh, um, uh, orbit around the Earth. Okay, so yeah, I, th I think that science fiction uh, is a great place for uh, authors to sort of test out scientific uh, ideas, and maybe even we could think about it as a laboratory 
uh, for the imagination. Um, I think it's really exciting to think about the discovery and exploration that the OSIRIS-REx mission uh, is going to open up uh, for humankind. Um, and I think it's also exciting uh, to think um, about the really wide variety of ways um, that asteroids might become uh, a bigger part, not just of our stories, uh, but of our future history. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, I'll introduce my colleague, uh, Chris Kokinos, um, who's an associate professor uh, of creative writing here. Um, he's the author of several books, uh, including most recently, The Sonoran Desert, A Literary Field Guide, um, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, A Personal Chronicle of Vanished Birds. Um, and among many of his national recognitions and fellowships, I'll mention that uh, he was an NSF visiting writer fellow in Antarctica um, as part of the research for the book that he'll read from today, uh, which is called The Fallen Sky, An Intimate History of Shooting Stars. Please help me welcome Chris. Thank you. Let's get this a little closer. Is that good? Can you hear me in the back? Am I good? Okay. Thank you, Scott. Um, oh, and before I forget, um, uh, Gloria McMillan, who's been one of the great organizers here in front, has a sign-up sheet since Scott's been talking so wonderfully about science fiction, and I'm so glad he's in the department for a variety of reasons, and science fiction is one of them, um, a sign-up sheet for a local hard science fiction reading group and um, uh, organization. So if you're interested, please please check that out. Um, and just a, a, a thank you for, um, for, for coming out. And so I, um, I was, yeah, uh, sort of um, still can't quite believe I was in Antarctica. Um, I'm not going to read from that portion of the book, um, but uh, I don't know if Tim is still in the room, but Tim, there he is. Yeah, so as he's heard me say many times before, um, um, we were in Antarctica together. That's where I met Tim, um, and uh, we had conversations outside our cold tents uh, for a couple of weeks, so um, it was a very interesting experience. So I think what I'll do here, um, you're going to have this wonderful image in front of you. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read. So I was going to do some slides, but um, I thought we'd just do like the ancient PowerPoint of imagining what certain things look like. So, <laughs> you know, uh, that which we used to do. Um, oh, and I want to I suggest a book. Actually, it just happened that I'm reading this book right now. I, uh, like Scott, teach uh, science fiction um, in, the, uh, in the English department. Um, and, uh, and I'm reading a, a, a novel by a writer named George Zabrowski. I don't know if anybody knows him. Um, Tim's furrowing his brow. Um, and uh, it's called Macro Life. Not a good title. It sounds a little bit like a textbook. Um, but um, it is largely set inside um, um, interstellar uh, multi-generational um, asteroids that you know, have been repurposed to, to move into the stars. So um, it's a good book. I recommend it. So I'm going to just read a couple sections from the book and, and be mindful of time. And I know it's getting later in the afternoon. So I'm going to read from the introduction and then um, hope to read a little bit from the prologue. We'll get to create the solar system together here. Okay. So this is from um, the introduction to the book, The Fallen Sky. On any clear night, under a dark enough sky, we can see shooting stars. We wish upon them, even if we don't quite know what they are. Of course, they're not really stars. And even if we don't know where they come from, or what they might tell us about the universe. It's as if we're eager to pin our chances on something strange and sudden, something beautiful beyond our ken. Across cultures and time, we have written ourselves into the sky. We create constellations, transforming the random spatter of stars into shapes and stories. We name planets after gods, and we associate meteors and meteorites, the light of dust or rocks burning passage through the air and the stones that after such fire sometimes fall to earth, with the most elemental aspects of our lives, good luck, ill fortune, and even death. Meteorites are, in fact, implicated in the seeding of life's ingredients on Earth. And even the most indifferent know that these bits of former asteroids have rained devastation in the past and threatened to do so in the future. Meteorites are the alpha and omega of geology. These rocks, mere rocks, encompass the origins of life and the fact of death on our planet. 
So not surprisingly, and as Scott has told us a little bit about this, we try to tame the wild wildness of meteorites by incorporating them into popular culture. Movies show humanity outgunning asteroids or comets headed for Earth, or at least surviving the effects of massive impacts. Accounts of actual space rocks whizzing by are relegated to the inside pages of newspapers. But then again, the front page of the July 5th, 2004 Weekly World News, grocery store tabloid, announced, quote, Another meteor fells the Pope. <laughs> Amazingly, the 900 pound stone did not kill him, though the photo shows the pontiff rather unhappy under all that weight. <laughs> An episode of Gilligan's Island called Meet the Meteor featured a meteorite that accelerated the aging of the hapless castaways, which was it's actually good that none of the meteorites from Antarctica do that. Um, Tim and I would both be dead probably a meteorite that accelerated the aging of the hapless castaways, but they survived, and the professor even made a Geiger counter out of bamboo. <laughs> There's Superman, of course. And in an otherwise forgettable movie, my super ex-girlfriend, Uma Thurman, gets her superpowers from a meteorite. So humor dilutes threats, as does possession, literal or metaphoric. We can set meteorites on our shelves, displaying them as specimens, including some iron meteorites that have been melted into fantastic shapes, like Henry Moore sculptures, and sometimes just as pricey. An English breakfast cereal, Shreddies, once included little packets of meteorite dust as a promotional giveaway, and I've wondered how many kids sprinkled those treats over cereal and milk. <laughs> More poignantly, we christen asteroids to make them serve our needs. Astronomers have bestowed the names solidarity, magnanimity, mag magnanimity, and compassion upon three asteroids as tributes to the victims of the September 11th attacks. Meteors, shooting stars, flash across the sky all the time. Some of them contain rocks that are large enough to fall more or less intact onto the Earth's surface. This has been happening for billions of years. Covertly dark or blandly gray, often woefully misshapen. That's what many meteorites look like. Lumps so ordinary seeming that most people never notice these rocks have landed on farm fields, deserts, shorelines, or backyards. The untrained eye can even mistake some meteorites for chunks of concrete, as if a road crew had jackhammered a solar highway and sent its congeries spilling down, briefly lit, to land among soybeans or ferns. Those who quest for meteorites, however, recognize them amidst the average rubble of the earth the way a birder hears rare song untangling itself from a forest full of sound. Passion does that. It sharpens one's senses. It changes the world. Amateur collectors, professional dealers, and planetary scientists are eager to obtain and understand these stones. Many people, myself among them, discount the notions of heavenly jurisdiction over a person's life whether it's thinking your wish upon a falling star has come true or believing in a horoscope. Yet I found in writing this book uh, that in actual and often moving ways, the fallen sky can reveal secrets not only of the solar system, but of our hearts. That's why this is an intimate history of shooting stars. We go out hunting meteorites, and some of us find ourselves instead. Years ago, when I lived in eastern Kansas, I was trying to deepen my connection to the tall grass prairie to find stories that might enrich those austere horizons. Thumbing through a volume by the nature writer Edwin Teal, I came across a history of a homesteading farm wife, this is mid 19th century, who harvested not only wheat, but one of the rarest meteorites known to science. I was then also writing a book about extinct birds, and I couldn't yet fathom that the grief I felt about their fates was also in part an expression of many inarticulate griefs that I carried in my life. Prompted by those inner darknesses, by the words of Teal's and of Teal and others, I went outside at night and looked up. I saw and learned the stars. I used them as a balm. And I saw meteors, sudden thin streaks on any given night, showers of them in the summer, watching with my wife as we camped beside a marsh and sand dunes in Colorado and in our front yard, the one I would walk away from, long after fireballs had exploded one November, golden shocks in the sky. All this led me to learn more about meteorites than I ever thought I could. And so the book became a chronicle of some of the most important meteorites we know of, stones that have altered our knowledge of the solar system and our place in it, and as such serves as a kind of informal record of scientific rec recognition over the past 200 years. The science, so fast moving, it's impossible to keep up, ranges from studying the primordial delivery of amino acids in meteorites to assessing the dangers of asteroids classified by epic names like Apollo's. 
I've especially tried to convey how individuals and cultures have valued meteorites, how they've been venerated as objects of power and continue to be objects of profit. But also, and this is crucial, how meteorites have become, through the rigors of science and the marvels of story, objective correlatives for our desire to live with both explanation and mystery. So the book covers um, a number of different um, places and um, scientific topics and, and meteorites. And just, I'll just give you a quick sort of um, sample of, of some of the things that I, that I write about. Um, a gentleman just came up before the talk um, and was asking me about uh, Meteor Crater. How many people have gone to Meteor Crater here in Arizona? Several, of course. Um, and the stories of a couple of scientists associated with Meteor Crater. Uh, Daniel Berenger, who was a mining engineer, um, who uh, postulated in the 19th century when it was not popular to postulate that impacts um, had uh, rained down on the Earth and the Moon um, and that they were recent and that meteor crater was in fact formed by a large meteorite. Um, as it happens, one of the leading geologists of the day was also thinking along the same lines, but he backed away when he couldn't find the evidence that he thought he was looking for. So Berenger um, buys meteor crater sight unseen um, and starts drilling and drilling and digging and looking for that giant meteorite, which of course he never finds. Um, and uh, all, you know, there, there are bits of it, there are uh, little bits of melt and so forth around the area it was in fact caused by a meteorite, but he never found the giant nickel iron chunk that he thought he would make a lot of money off of. So there's a story like that and it ends really tragically for him. I won't, I won't uh, you know, give that part of the plot away. Harvey Neiniger comes along many years later. Um, another Kansas character that I found out about when I was living in Kansas, um, he was a professor um, and had uh, received a, a master's degree from Pomona College in um, entomology and was kind of having a midlife crisis. He's like, what will I do as a scientist? And he sees a fireball. Um, and I actually went to McPherson, Kansas, stood on the corner where he stood. He had marked with chalk with his friend, a music professor, um, where he saw that so he could track, hopefully, and find uh, where meteorites may have fallen. He didn't find meteorites from that particular event, but he would go on to become um, a very successful and very controversial meteorite hunter. And again, at a time when that was a kind of backwater in science. I think we sort of take, you know, we take the fact of asteroids and meteors and meteorites rather for granted now, but even as late as um, you know, the 1980s, when the first um, scientists were talking about the extinction of the dinosaurs being caused by an impact, the New York Times editorialized, you know, maybe that should just sort of stay in the realm of science fiction. So th this, is, this has been you know, a relatively sort of a new area um, for science to, to take account of. Um, one of the things I thought about reading today was about Eugene Shoemaker, another Arizona figure um, who was involved in understanding um, impact geology, a pioneering um, um, uh, scientist in, in that field. Um, but I didn't have time for that. But I would just recommend uh, Eugene Shoemaker's biography and his story to you if you're interested. So I thought actually we'd just get right back to the beginning and start with um, the uh, beginning of the solar system. Uh, it's not often that a nonfiction writer gets to sort of play God and, um, you know, control the universe and create the solar system. So just a couple quick pages um, to talk about where all of this begins. And I brought my own little uh, meteorite here with me. It's my little token to, rem to remind myself right, four and a half billion years to come up with this rock and the rest of us, right? Well, how did that happen? And it begins really with dust. And dust gets a bad rap. It's an adjective for products whose nouns are mop, remover, or buster. In Queen's song, which I won't sing, another one bites the dust. The rock group Kansas whimpered that all we are is dust in the wind. The slow shall be left in the dust. The feckless shall eat my dust. History, when forgotten, dies in a dustbin. Dust to dust, we're told, emphasis on the dry conclusion. Despite the welcome richness of gold dust, which is preferable, a rainstorm or a dust storm. Given its rarity, gold dust doesn't kick up in high winds to smother homesteads and towns. Other dust, from prosaic to suffocating, dominates our lives. 20 years ago, when I first moved to Kansas from Indiana, I kept brushing what seemed like eraser shavings off my desk, then looked up to see an orange sky, a dust storm. I thought I had moved to the apocalypse. 
There are no dams that will stop a flood of dust. Most of us prefer rain. The dictionary offers this disagreeable definition of dust. One, powdery earth or other matter in bits fine enough to be easily suspended in air. Two, a cloud of such matter. Three, confusion, turmoil. Four, A, earth, especially as the place of burial. B, mortal remains disintegrated or thought of as disintegrating to earth. Five, a humble or abject condition. Six, anything worthless. So, when I lived in Kansas, Nearly every morning, I'd wet old rags, then tie them to a broom. I'd push, turn, and drag the jury rig mop across oak floors, retrieving especially egregious aggregations from beneath the bed. Then I would step to the front stoop, lift the yellow dust mop to the sky as if it were a banner in my war on entropy, and shake it like mad. Hair, grit, mites, skin, floss, lint, insect bits, pollen, seeds, poof, all manner of heinous detritus. With cheer, I launched them all. The cloud usually traveled east toward a neighbor's yard, but he never complained. Had he, at least not to me, <laughs> had he, I might have told him that dust is life, even if it makes us sneeze. Dust, it turns out, is Genesis. The story of the solar system and all that follows from meteorites and asteroids and those who cherish them begins with dust. Stars died. They exploded. There were, researchers have conjectured, perhaps up to 10 supernovae whose traces we can read in the solar system today. When such stars explode, the remains gather together at far distance to start again as dust entrained with capes of gas. Supernovae occur when large stars, those about 25 times heftier than our sun, can no longer burn. They've run out of fuel, one element after another having been gobbled up through hunger and change. After burning hydrogen, helium, carbon, neon, and oxygen in successfully shorter ages, comes the last day in the life of such a star, a few hours fueled by silicone. Within the star, iron is about to be shredded like a puffball because iron makes less energy than it needs in order to be a fusion source. One ordinary second ends it all. The star collapses, sending shockwaves slamming through it, and the star just rips apart. Previously, the star had expelled carbon gas, which eventually condenses into diamonds, countless trillions of diamonds, as scientist Harry McSween puts it, but not a single one will ever grace a pendant or seal a marriage vow. The supernova itself casts out, among other things, a rare form of xenon that infuses into those interstellar diamonds, and some of those micro diamonds make their way into meteorites that land on Earth. It took two decades of painstaking work by chemist Edward Anders and other scientists to coax from meteorites the traces of all that interstellar material. Oxygen, plutonium, and iodine are forged in the hearts of dying stars. Gold, too, all that sent forth in a flash of iron demise. Stardust soared from explosions brighter than galaxies. Gas billowed. Shockwaves with their linty freight hit other particles and gases already lingering in one small pocket of the Milky Way. Gravity rescued them. About 4.6 billion years ago, this cloud of dust and gas began slowly to contract, rotate, and flatten. The heart of the pre-solar nebula began to quicken, and within a few thousand years, a protostar, not yet fusing hydrogen, went through phases of contraction, expansion, and varied brightness. It took some 10,000 years for outward gas pressure to balance against gravitational contraction, then another 10 million years for the protostar to condense just enough to create what became our sun, whose interior pressures forced a sustained hydrogen fusion reaction at 10 million degrees. Grains, flecks, pebbles accreted into rocks. They became careening piles of rocks, then boulders upon boulders. Once these objects were more than a half mile wide, gravity superseded chance accretion, electrostatic attraction, and drag, thereby speeding up the formation of the planetesimals. These minor planets, the asteroids, were born. From them would come meteorites. Easily told in a few sentences, this transformation from a dusty disk to a solar system took millions of years. Dust birthed the planets. Earth too. So you need not be a meteorite scientist or a meteorite collector, although you can get this in the mail from a dealer, <laughs> to touch this body, for it reaches us every day, though in forms, dust, and micrometeorites too small to notice without fancy equipment. A scientist who studies space dust, Donald Brownlee, once said that, quote, if you had lettuce for lunch, you probably ate a few cosmic dust particles. 
I love this image of the cosmos begetting us and our hungers, and our hunger eating the cosmos in a salad at Denny's. If you stuck, <laughs> if you stuck, I get no money for using Denny's. But if you stuck your tongue out on a winter's day, tasting the snow up on Mount Lemon, you may have swallowed meteor dust. So we don't have to go to Bennu. We're all eating stars every day. Thank you. But I hasten to add, I'm glad we're going there. So any questions? Um, yes, I was, yes, Indiana University. Yes, that's right. Yeah, Hoagy Carmichael Stardust. That's a good, yeah, okay. excellent. Yeah, yes. I should have been playing that. Sometimes when I do a talk from the book, I'll play uh, 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 Perry Perry uh, Perry Como's uh, Catch a Falling Star. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right here. Uh, when asteroids were discovered in the early 19th century, did they capture the popular literary imagination at all at that time, or was that too early? As far as I know, it was too early. Um, you know, it was really before science fiction had really started. So it was 17 years before Frankenstein. Um, you know, I think I think um, comets might have been, well, shooting stars absolutely have, a kind of, have long had a kind of romance about them. Comets as well, which we discovered a uh, hundred or so years earlier. I think Halley's Comet is in the er, 1705, maybe, Halley, because, you can, because it's more visible. Um, but uh, I think it was a fairly slow discovery of the asteroid belt after that. Once we really got into writing science fiction, asteroids were, were uh, fair game. Yeah. Um, how much do you think science fiction has um, contributed to the overall like, um, evolution of our technologies in society? <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a very big question. I, I think, I think a lot because all of the scientists that I know have read science fiction, and you know, it's it's been something that even when it doesn't uh, very directly give an idea to a scientist, it still makes science fun and exciting and something that's interesting to uh, think about and and sort of exercise your imagination with and. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think that there are indirect ways that science fiction feeds in, um, as well as you know potentially direct ways. Uh, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars uh, uh, trilogy is very closely based on uh, uh, sort of the latest uh, up-to-date material science work and the kind of uh, the experiment they were doing up at the biosphere too uh, at the time. And I know that he was talking. Uh, with those scientists that he was borrowing from, and they probably got ideas back from him as well. And yeah, I would just say too, I, th I, I agree with all of that, and I think another thing that it does in that sort of indirect sort of way is that it, science fiction, <clears throat> although, you know, since the 1960s, written science fiction has become more character driven, there's still, it's like, you know, look at the, this photograph, right? It's a, it's a widening of the context, and it, it takes people out of ordinary mundane reality, as interesting as that can be, but widens the context and gives, gives us a, a sense of wonder, which is a phrase you hear a lot of people who think about science fiction talk about, and I think that's inspirational for scientists and for the rest of us. But yeah, Chris, Chris knows more science fiction actually uh, than I do. He's, he's the real boss. No, no, we're both we're both we're both science fiction buffs. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. Well, I guess I'd, I'd answer the question in part by saying that you know there are scholars who would say that um, um, 
uh, something called proto science fiction. So uh, mythology, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, the, which is a five thousand year old story, the oldest story in the Western canon, has sort of um, elements of, of of science fiction, if not technology, that sense of wonder that we were just talking about. Um, in terms of stories that directly deal with um, religion, um, Arthur C. Clarke has a story called the Nine billion names of God, um, a story called The Star. James Blish has a, a series of stories uh, um, that are um, about um, a Catholic uh, priest, you know, going to going to the planet. So I would say that it does, it, at about the same time, um, Ceres is discovered at the end of the 19th century. Um, there's, there, there was an ongoing discussion. It really goes back, uh, you know, much uh, further um, about the plurality of worlds. I mean, as, as science began to show us how big you know, the sky really was, there was like, well, there would be maybe other worlds orbiting these other stars. That raised a whole series of really difficult theological questions. Uh, one of which was, um, would God send his son to all of these planets to die for people's sins? And th this, so, the, so I think the, the relationships among um, theological and religious questions, science, and how we write about those things is, is really tangled. Thank you all. And uh, I think that Chris has uh, copies of his book. Is that correct? I don't know. Yeah. Somebody's, are, are there books out there for sale? I don't know. If there are, I hear he'd be happy I to sign them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming and have a nice day, everyone.